to the Explorers. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. Last time, we talked a bit about religion and we found our way around a Tudor era bathroom. Now we're ready to scrub ourselves clean. Grab a linen cloth and your favorite pomander. Let's go traveling. And so we move on to washing. When we talk about history, we often think they must have suffered a high level of stink. But if we stop to think about this for more than three seconds, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Few people of any time period want to walk around covered in dirt and smelling like an overripe melon. It turns out that your average tutor cares a lot about personal hygiene. How do we know? Here's our time-traveling companion, Ruth Goodman. So firstly, I'd say that people talk about clean a lot. It, ma it mattered to them. They minded. They are, there are jokes and stories and disgusting reports of people who were not clean. Um, stinking beasts are mentioned quite a lot. You know? People talk about somebody who smells. So clearly there were differences between those who smelt more and those who smelt less, or those who smelt what was considered to be good and those who smelt what was considered to be bad. So that's a sort of starting frame. People cared about personal hygiene. They cared about smell. They cared about it on health grounds as well as on the pleasantness of being around grounds, on manners and so forth. Are we going to take a soak in a full-body bath? Heavens no! We're working with the miasmatic theory of disease here, the idea that evil miasmas float around on the air, carrying plague and other nasties, which enter through the pores of our skin. Use no baths or stoves, Tudor physician Thomas Moulton writes, nor sweat too much. For all openeth the pores of a man's body, and maketh the venomous air to enter, and for to infect the blood. If you believed that your skin was one of the most important barriers between you and infection, and that closing off your pores would protect you from the mysterious sweating sickness, of course you'd be leery of full-body washing. But that doesn't mean we aren't interested in cleanliness. We tutors are fairly obsessed with it. Most people will be taking sponge baths rather than immersing themselves in any tub. We will begin by washing our faces and hands with clean, sometimes perfumed water. There are lots of facial washes recommended for skin issues. Have pimples? Sir Hugh Platt, in his household manual Delights for Ladies, published in the year 1600, offers remedies that range from the fairly gentle, mix some salt with some lemon juice, then wet a linen cloth with it and pat the face as needed, to the fairly intense. Brimstone, ground with the oil of turpentine, and applied to any pimple one hour, maketh the flesh to rise spongious, which being anointed with the thick oil of butter that ariseth in the morning from new milk, sodden a little overnight, will heal and scale away in a few days, leaving a fair skin behind. Oh my. Washing our feet is among our most crucial morning routines. Though we Tudor ladies don't have to worry about smelly feet as much as the modern woman, as our pure wool stockings and leather shoes are breathable. Unlike synthetic sneakers, they discourage infection and let our sweat dry out. There are heaps of recipes for soap floating around in our household instruction manuals. Sir Hugh gives a recipe for a washing ball made out of Castile soap. The wealthy tend to stay away from soap altogether, though, as it's often made with things like tallow and potash, opting for so-called washing water instead. This is essentially water infused with herbs like sage, rosemary, and orange peel. Though most people will only be washing their hands, faces, and feet on the daily, people are taking full-body baths in Tudor England. Henry VIII takes hooped, portable tubs with him wherever he goes. London's public baths will open up in 1564, and the town of Bath has been using their Roman-era baths for much longer than that. But given the bath's connection to vice and a dangerous level of pore opening, we ladies are unlikely to spend much time there. 
Elizabeth I will be quite fond of the private baths her dad builds at Hampton Court, as well as the steam bath at Richmond Palace. But spa time isn't just for royalty. For the lady looking for a little steam at home, we have somewhere to turn. Our friend Sir Hugh, in Delights for Ladies, suggests the following. Bore some holes into your tub. Then grab a lidded brass pot and make a hole in its lid, just big enough to fit a lead pipe through. Add in some herbs and water, put it on the fire, and when it's nice and steamy, put it under your holy tub, climb in, and put a sheet over your head. The steam will rise up through the holes and envelop you in its cleansing goodness. Though, Sir Hugh makes sure to warn us to be careful, as any drafts might offend you whilst your body is made open and porous to the air. But again, this is likely to be a sporadic luxury rather than a regular occurrence. So what does a Tudor lady smell like? Do we just need to accept a certain level of smell? Let's ask our expert. Well, I've tried it. I've tried it in two contexts. I've tried it in a modern context and I've tried it in a Tudor context. Ruth wore a linen smock, or shift, and period-appropriate woolen tights under her modern-day clothes. She changed them daily, and also did what Sir Thomas Eliot, in his book on good health, published in 1534, suggests. Rub the body with a coarse linen cloth, first deftly and easily, and after to increase more and more, to a hard and swift rubbing, until the flesh do swell and be somewhat ruddy. This is meant to bring toxins to the surface of the skin and draw them out through the pores. During this time, Ruth didn't bathe or shower for months. And guess what? That was okay. It was okay. There was a slight smell. There was a slight, you know, if you were in a heated, centrally heated office with someone, I, don't, I think they'd moan. Um, but if you were sort of out and about doing, or in your own home or whatever, it, it was passable. Um, most people didn't recognise that I was doing it. I did it for six months and uh, I got next to no comments whatsoever. Ruth tried this again while filming at Tudor Monastery Farm. Again, no showers, no soap, no washing her entire body. She changed her linen smock and head wrap only once a week. I was wearing entirely period clothes, so this time it wasn't like modern clothes over the top of it. It was the full Tudor stuff. So it was all linens and wools. And we were outside, and there were fires. And again, nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. I did the full six months. And that time it was only changing once a week because we were outdoors and I didn't have any modern fibres on me. I felt more confident about it. Um, and they didn't realise. So it's clearly a viable system. A colleague of hers, though, he took daily showers with modern hygiene products, but pretty much never changed or washed his underwear or outfit. Ruth describes his scent as, in a word, overpowering. He didn't change the clothing, um, and, uh, and, and the clothing started to really stink, really stink. I mean, he was clean, um, but his clothing wasn't, and everybody commented on that, everybody. <laughs> At certain points in the, in, the, in the period, we actually had a little cabal and we stole the clothing and washed it. <laughs> Okay, so what's the deal here? How do we stay fresh without regular applications of hot water and body wash? The answer is twofold, the power of linen and how regularly it gets laundered. Since we Tudors believe that diseases come from the air and pass through our pores, one of the best ways to stay healthy is to keep as much of our bodies covered as possible. No matter who you are, queen or pauper, you'll wear a full layer of linen underneath your clothes. Smocks, hose, cuffs, caps. This natural base layer helps keep you warm in winter and cool in summer, and it's a mighty barrier between you and the filth of the world. It's breathable, and when you shift this layer, aka take it off, it's believed that you pull dirt and grease away in the weave of the cloth. It's not like, you know, an antiseptic as such, but there are in inhibitors, bacterial inhibitors within natural fibers, both wool and cotton. These natural fibers can work wonders. They're also easy to wash, and that's crucial. You don't really wash the body, you wash the clothes. Outer clothes, you can't really wash them. You wouldn't wash an overcoat, would you? So it's this underlayer that's getting washed. Um, and the more frequently you can wash 
the better. And so we are fastidious about changing and laundering it daily. The wealthy ladies amongst us might change our linen several times a day. It's a point of pride to wear clean linen. Those who don't, writes contemporary Richard Jones, might be jeopardizing their relationships. In his book about how to have a happy marriage, he says that a woman who wears dirty linen shall neither be praised of strangers or delight her husband. And it's true that linen undies help keep us stink-free. And if you think about it scientifically, that makes sense, doesn't it? Body odor is created by bacteria. Uh, who are feeding on the sweat of your body. It's not the sweat necessarily that smells, it's the bacteria feeding on it that produces the smell. So clothing, holding that sweat, is going to be much more uh, somewhere where body odor collects and, and is created than actually on your skin. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the changing of clothing is really important. Natural Tudor fibers, too. Synthetic modern fibers, still zero. We tutors also want to make sure our breaths are taken care of. So we'll clean our teeth, not with a brush, but with a cloth and some kind of tooth powder. There are plenty of recipes for making your own. For a whitening mouthwash, our friend Sir Hugh suggests we boil a mixture of honey, vinegar, and wine. You know what else is good at whitening and cleaning your teeth? Soot, apparently, preferably from a wax candle. It's fairly easy to come by. Just hold your candle's flame against a clean, polished surface like a mirror or glass pane. It's a soft abrasive and a deodorizer, too. You might also try salt or chalk. Some recipes add perfumes to the equation and are filled with herbs like cloves, which smell nice but also serve a medicinal purpose. Cloves ease pain and mouth pains aren't uncommon. We'll take our love of nice scents even further with a bit of perfume. We believe that when scents enter our bodies, they go up our noses and past two nipple-like organs at the tippy top of them, traveling on to a kind of net around our brain. What scents we're breathing in can impact our health and our spirits, so best make sure they're always good. Most people get their scents from natural sources. Rosemary for memory, lavender for a good night's sleep herbs burnt on the fire for cleansing. Such things can sometimes get expensive. Robert Dudley, Queen Elizabeth's favorite and the master of her horse, yeah he was, will spend about a pound in 1558 on herbs just as true around his chambers. Some scents will be associated with particular times and places. Frankincense will make us think of church. Wormwood, the pungent herb we use to get rid of vermin, might make us think of cleaning. Romance-inducing rose oil is the signature scent of Henry VIII. It requires a huge number of petals and is expensive to come by, even in our era. So if someone gives you a perfume bottle filled with it, you'll know he's courting you pretty hard. The most common form of perfume comes in a pomander, a small pouch or perforated container filled with herbs or a solid-scented ball. It's tied around our waists or worn on a chain around our necks so we can bring it up to our noses when we happen upon something offensive smelling. After all, we believe that disease is often carried on the wind, so this is about health as much as our comfort. And in Tudor-era England, bad smells are something we're bound to come upon. Now we're fresh and ready to dress. Next time, we'll explore the kinds of clothes we'll be wearing, what they're made of, who's allowed to wear what, and why they're so expensive. See you then! Thanks for listening. If you like the show, tell a friend about it or leave a review wherever you listen. I want to thank a few of my patrons who really help keep the show going. My newest pirate queens, Kata and Erin, and my newest lady president, Lauren L. My newest boss lady, Annabelle, plus Bethany, Bronwyn, Elizabeth M., Grace, Hillary and Brian, Melissa K., Michelle, Monique, Nuria, Rebecca, Sarah S., Tanya, and Jessica, Sophie, and Julian. My newest adventuress, Anna, plus Alexis, Carlos, Helena, Iris, Jessica R., 
Amber, Kelly, Lizzie, Phil, Samantha, and Stephanie. Much love goes to my warrior queens, Avery and Lori, my imperial empress, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks, and my lady pharaohs who are all named Courtney. All hail the mighty Courtneys. To explore the exclusive bonus episodes and other goodies that patrons receive, just head over to my website and click on Become a Patron. A huge thanks to Ruth Goodman for time traveling with us. Make sure to check out all her work on the Tudor era and her newest book, The Domestic Revolution. The period appropriate guitar music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of John Sales. For show notes, including a transcript, images, and a list of my sources, just go to my website, theexplorespodcast.com. You can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Much love to Paul Gablonski for my theme music and logo, and Chris from Natural RP, Jordan, and Jim DiBartolo for their vocal stylings. 